uh, as we as they say we keep the uh, best for the last so we will be having now um, a maternal collapse of covid-19 pregnant and uh, this is uh, uh, will be presented by our eminent uh, professor anesthesiologist dr nasreen rifai and i think this is the uh, lecture that we are all waiting for so dr nasreen please uh, start I'd like to thank Dr. Saad and all uh, mega course uh, colleagues, and I'm happy to share my professor, Dr. Asmat, and my junior colleagues in this uh, obstetric anesthesia scientific day. I'll talk about maternal collapse management for COVID-19 patients. Uh, the first slide, I'm, I was talking about the World Federation Society of Anesthesiologists, which gave a statement saying protecting healthcare providers is the first priority. As you are our f line of defense for this patient and upcoming patients. So the WAFSA says your safety comes first. In this, this lecture, I talk about um, introduction physiological changes relevant to maternal resuscitation, causes of maternal cardiac arrest, maternal resuscitation guidelines in COVID-19 patient and perimortem cesarean section. Uh, we used to say the, the maternal collapse, the incidence of arrest during pregnancy was one to uh, each uh, 20 or 30,000 cases. So maternal survival rate is very low. It's as low as 7% as reported. The most complicated arrest scenario is the maternal collapse because you have to deal with two patients, the mother and fetus. And multiple teams are required, um, cardiac arrest team, anesthesia, obstetrician, and neonatology. The Center of Disease Control and Prevention in USA um, have recently in November 5th, uh, gave this statement. They say pregnant women are at increased risk of severe illness from COVID-19. Uh, as Dr. Khaled said, it, they are not more, um, um, they, they don't get COVID-19 more often than um, other pregnant patients, uh, but they are considered as high risk patient because uh, when uh, they um, uh, they experience uh, any respiratory infection, uh, they deteriorate rapidly, uh, and they are more likely to be admitted to ICU, receive invasive ventilation, ECMO, and increased risk of death compared to non-pregnant women. Uh, also, the, C the CDC um, have uh, launched this statement that pregnant women with COVID-19 in the United States from January to uh, November 3rd, they had a total cases of 36,000 and total deaths of 50. According to American Journal of Obstetric and Gynecology, the, we'll find that uh, the rate of maternal death uh, due to COVID-19 is uh, very uh, conflicting. Each study and each survey is different than the other. For example, the American Journal said uh, among nine pregnant women with severe COVID-19, seven of the nine have died, one remained critically ill and ventilator dependent, and one of the nine recovered after prolonged hospitalization. However, another um, review in the uh, European Journal of Medical Research, uh, they it was a um, systematic review and meta-analysis. And they found that uh, from the total coronavirus infected pregnant women, more than 56% uh, delivered by cesarean, 31% admitted to ICU, while 2.7 died. And among the perinatal outcome, they have recorded a rate of perinatal death about 2.2%. Uh, now we will talk about giving CPR to a pregnant woman, what we need to know. 
first you have to uh, to be uh, acquainted to all physiological changes that occur during pregnancy and the most two important relevant systems to our work are the cardiovascular and respiratory system uh, regarding the respiratory system Um, the blood volume increases, the cardiac output increases, uh, there's increased oxygen consumption, decrease in systemic vascular resistance. Uh, this important change in the, uh, regarding the cardiovascular system, uh, we have to know uh, about the aortocaval compression. Here, uh, the gravid uterus, especially after 20 weeks of gestation, compressed on the aorta and um, inferior vena cava against the spine, and this will decrease the venous return and cardiac output, uh, uh, leading to severe hypotension. But when we put the patient in the left uterine, um, um, uh, position or tilt the manually tilt the uterus away this will relieve the compression and increase the venous return what are the causes of maternal arrest generally we have obstetric and non obstetric causes the obstetric causes include hemorrhage uh, pregnancy induced hypertension idiopathic peripartum uh, cardiomyopathy anesthetic complication amniotic fluid embolism the non obstetric causes include pulmonary embolism, infection in 13%, stroke, myocardial infarction, and trauma. Um, according to advanced life support and uh, ACLS uh, courses, uh, we are used to um, deal with the four H's and four T's of arrest. And you can apply to uh, pregnancy. You have hypovolemia due to bleeding, uh, hypoxia as a um, patient with respiratory um, distress or uh, coronavirus, and so on. This is the algorithm of um, the resuscitation council of UK. This is uh, the um, algorithm uh, adopted since 2015 in the non-COVID patient. This is the algorithm of um, American Heart Association for COVID 19 patient. Uh, here we'll talk about the resuscitation uh, council of UK. Uh, actually, we have the uh, International Liaison Committee, uh, which um, review all the um, um, studies, the systematic reviews, and they um, um, come with the uh, guidelines that all uh, resuscitation councils uh, uh, should adopt. Uh, so they are almost the same, but they just express the algorithm in a different way. So according to the resuscitation council of UK, if we look here, we, you will find that um, during arrest, when you assess a rhythm and you find a shockable rhythm, you give up to three stacked shocks. Normally, we don't do that. The normal algorithm in non-COVID patient, we give uh, one shock for the shockable rhythm, then two minus CPR, then another shock. Here, we give three uh, shocks. That's a very important um, uh, difference between the two algorithms. Uh, first, let's know the general principles of the resuscitation council uh, in September 2020. They said that the main principle of resuscitation is safety of patients and staff. WHO identified CPR as a resource generating uh, procedure. Uh, throughout the pandemic, the resuscitation council advised that um, for a um, resource generating procedure, the uh, full PPE should be used for chest compression and advanced airway procedure. Identify the patient at risk of cardiac arrest. Staff treating COVID-19 patient in cardiac arrest must know how to uh, do donning and doffing of the uh, resurgerating procedure uh, PPE. 
it's acknowledged that it may cause a brief delay in starting chest compression. And they uh, recommend that if we discuss the um, uh, critical condition with the patient and relatives, uh, they should know, uh, according to the, uh, the law, they should know that the, um, um, the team will take some time to uh, full, uh, done the full PPE, although this will uh, cause delay in uh, starting the compression. We can decrease this time of delay by, by uh, multiple training and um, um, the, uh, the team um, takes about from three to five minutes to, for uh, full um, PPE donning, but it can decrease to one minute with a proper training. The WHO described two modes of transmission of COVID-19, droplet transmission and airborne transmission. CPR is a complex intervention of uh, multiple um, uh, procedures, ventilation, defib, uh, chest compression, drugs. So when the WHO and other um, organizations um, uh, say that um, C CPR is a result uh, producing, uh, uh, generating procedure and it may transmit infection, actually they cannot uh, detect which part of the CPR is responsible for transmission, but they uh, suggest that chest compression may be aerosol generating because uh, chest compression generate passive ventilation, as we know, with small tidal volumes. And the risker is in physical contact with the patient, the one who is performing chest compression. But regarding defibrillation, we have a benefit which uh, outweighs the risk the deep fibrillation within the first few minutes may achieve uh, ROSC, which means re return of spontaneous circulation. And it's very important because here we are not, uh, we don't need to continue resuscitation. And there's no evidence that deep fibrillation generate aerosol. It, it doesn't generate aerosol. Especially if we use the new adhesive pads, so the rescue will be away from the patient. Do you think that uh, for, for resuscitation of COVID-19 patient, uh, this should be uh, the team? Of course not. This is the team of uh, resuscitation for any patient, not for COVID-19. The team for um, a CPR for COVID-19 will look like this team. They all have the PPE and uh, they perform uh, chest compression and protect the airway. These are, uh, this photo is uh, very nice as it um, uh, shows the um, guide for safe PPE. This half represents the uh, phase two PPE. It's uh, PPE, but not uh, against aerosol generating procedures. So um, um, as an if this, we, and as uh, physicians, uh, we have to uh, put this PPE all the time, dealing with patients during pandemic, as any patient should be suspected as being uh, COVID-19. So in, uh, in, uh, we, we don't have, um, we, we just put on disposable apron, uh, not uh, uh, with long sleeves, uh, gloves, but not dub double gloves, eye protection, plus or minus um, a mask, it could be surgical mask, for example. But for aerosol generating procedure, PPE, we should have eye protection, either by goggles or by face shield, uh, respirator, which is N95, long sleeves, apron, and double gloves. Uh, according to the uh, Resuscitation Council of UK, the full AGP PPE is required for all attendees before chest compression and airway uh, measurement during cardiac arrest. And uh, they advise to treat all individual as suspected COVID-19 patient, as we are in a pandemic. DFAP can be delivered without full uh, PPE, as we said, and remember to maintain left uterine displacement. Uh, this graph shows the, uh, all 
the points that we stress on during resuscitation for um, uh, a, a patient who is pregnant and have COVID-19. The first responder, uh, if a staff member um, is um, uh, attended um, uh, arrest, for example, this patient should be identified from the start. We know the high risk patient who is uh, deteriorating and um, may be in high dependency or in ICU. Uh, and she's monitored by um, a nurse or um, someone of the, uh, the staff who has the PPE but not the full PPE. And he witnessed that the patient have collapsed. And he knows this patient has COVID-19. Uh, um, first, he calls for help and announces that it is COVID. So when he uh, starts the um, code blue, he says uh, it is a case of COVID. Then he assess the patient. But how to assess the patient? We don't do like this. We don't do um, uh, look, uh, listen, and feel. We don't put our cheek in front of patient's mouth, of course, uh, to decrease um, infection. We just detect there is no signs of life and the patient not breathing and no carotid pulse. Then activate the code blue and uh, state that it is a risk of COVID-19. Uh, if the patient was not on uh, oxygen, we can put a simple uh, mask of uh, oxygen with high flow. The second step is crowd control. It's priority to limit the number of people in the room to three to five. When the code team arrives, the initial team will rotate out, and that's very important. When the team arrives, the first responder or the team uh, who um, um, saw the patient first should rotate out. Either they are uh, uh, relieved, they don't go uh, in, or they um, can put on the full PPE and come to give help. When a specific role should be identified for each team member and establish cell phone contact. So as we see, there's a, a few members of the team inside the room, while all other people are outside the room, and some of them will um, give hand and um, supply uh, the material that the uh, team may require. Then, uh, before donning the PPE, you have, uh, if the uh, first responder um, uh, put the monitor, actually the patient should be monitored from the start, and uh, he identifies a shockable rhythm, he should go, leave the, the mask on the patient's face, but close the oxygen for safety, and uh, give three, up to three stacked shocks. So we defibrillate the shockable rhythm, no need for a PPE, the biphasic shock energy, 120 to 200 joules, and uh, this may provide early rusk, re uh, restoration of spontaneous circulation. What about defibrillation? The, actually, the transthoracic impedance does not change with pregnancy. So the defibrillation energy recommendation for uh, um, uh, maternal uh, collapse is the same as any algorithm. The biphasic shock, we give uh, 120 up to 200 joules. If we have external fetal monitor, should be uh, removed before defib. And uh, it, the, usually, the left uh, uterine lateral tilt with the large breast of the um, pregnant patient may make the um, uh, application of the defib um, at the apex and sternum difficult due to uh, the large breast and the tilt. So here we, it's advised to use the bi-axillary uh, electrode position. Um, the chest compression in uh, the pregnant patient could be um, difficult and need um, uh, more power due to decreased chest compliance. Some studies say put your hands two to three centimeters higher than the non-pregnant, but other uh, studies um, um, uh, uh, said no, just apply the normal position in the middle of the sternum. Left uterine displacement is a must, establish IV axis above the diaphragm. 
the many the left trying displacement we used to have many methods for left trying displacement uh, either to put a wedge under the right hip or tilt the table th uh, 15 degrees but uh, recently it's it's now um, recommended that the manual displacement with one hand or two hands is the best because it displaces the uterus uh, away from uh, the uh, aorta and the inferior vena cava and at the same time we don't tilt the table so the position for uh, resuscitation is uh, the same they found that the chest compression is the, the best if we apply this manual displacement PPE must be worn by all members of the team before pro providing chest compression no chest compression or airway procedure should uh, be done without the full PPE. Uh, but if you are alone with the patient and um, you have nothing to do and the team did not arrive yet, there's no problem if you uh, apply manual left uterine uh, tilt and start compression only CPR until the team arrives. As we said, it's we are not sure that it is um, actually um, um, uh, aerosol uh, uh, producing uh, procedure. Put a sample uh, oxygen mask on the patient face to limit aerosol spread. According to the resuscitation journal in um, uh, June, uh, they had a review about uh, COVID-19 in cardiac arrest and the risk of infection to rescue. This was a systematic review and it's very important because they concluded that it's uncertain whether the chest compression or defibrillation cause aerosol generation or transmit COVID-19 to rescue. And it's very limited evidence and we, we need further studies. Uh, what about airway management? Airway and ventilation, as Dr. Khaled said, should be performed by the most skilled provider. Uh, you can pose the chest compression during airway intervention. Use a viral filter as HEPA filter between the bag valve mask or ventilator and the airway, whether it is endotracheal tube or supraglottic device. Consider uh, video and just before intubation. It's very effective because uh, you don't need to be um, uh, near the, the patient mouth. You are away from the patient and you are protected. So um, using video laryngoscopy is recommended uh, during CPR. Uh, ventilation is delivered after tracheal intubation and cuff inflation. This is how we perform um, intubation with the full PPE and the video uh, uh, laryngoscopy. And we can use what's called intubation box and uh, this box is very good idea and it's very cheap can be easily manufactured and uh, we had a, a cheap and effective one in uh, our unit in Casa La India. Uh, as the, um, my colleague said when uh, you need to ventilate the patient even during arrest uh, you, you have to use two person bag uh, uh, mask technique so it's called VE technique because this, um, uh, the, when you, you use your both hands, it is a tight seal for the uh, mouth and this decreases the, uh, the risk of infection. Breathing modification, oxygenate well, monitor, avoid desaturation, avoid respiratory alkalosis, consider adjusting ventilation volume to a uh, tidal volume of 500 to 700, be aware of risk of aspiration in these patients. And as any uh, advanced life support core um, um, algorithm, we treat the reversible causes, hypoxia, hypovolemia, um, hypo and hyperkalemia and other electrolytes and uh, hypothermia. And the 40s, which are tension pneumothorax, tamponade, thrombosis, and toxins. Now we come to the peri-mortem caesarean section that one of uh, the um, attendee asked about. We continue CPR throughout the, uh, the arrest and prepare for incision at the fourth minute in order to um, um, 
the, uh, to get the fetus out at the fifth minute after the start of cardiac arrest. And this should be done in any um, uh, pregnant patient more than it, uh, 20 weeks gestational age. And uh, now in UK, they say um, it's not important the, the uh, gestational age. What's important is the fundal level. So if the fundal level of the uterus is at the level of umbilicus, this means this uterus is large enough to cause a vorticable compression. So we get the baby out if uh, we have uh, unsuccessful uh, CPR at the uh, fifth minute, that's not to rescue the baby, but to rescue the mother. Because when we, you get this compression uh, out, this in, uh, increases the um, venous return and um, um, the, um, the uh, CPR will be more effective. And this was detected um, a long time ago by um, um, uh, retrograde um, uh, reviews and studies that found greater uh, proportion of the, the arrested uh, mothers uh, could return of uh, sp uh, get the return of spontaneous circulation if we get the baby out after five minutes. Between uh, 20 weeks and um, if the, the, the gestational age more than 20 weeks, we may um, be able to uh, rescue the fetus. But keep in mind that we are resuscitating the mother. So our priority is the mother. And it's, it's now, it's not a kind of deb debate, it's in the guidelines. In any CP maternal collapse and you perform CPR for four minutes and it was unsuccessful, perimortem cesarean section should be done and take the baby out and continue CPR. What's important here is that uh, it's um, the, the all resuscitation council and the IELC uh, ad advised that we we get the baby out at, uh, by perimortem cesarean section even if frost is achieved. Can you imagine if the patient return to life and to spontaneous circulation and she's alive? We should perform perimortem uh, delivery even if we don't need to. I don't understand they didn't uh, um, um, explain this, but I think because this mother has severe hypoxia and severe um, uh, hypovolemia, so it's the best is to take the baby out even if she has uh, returned to spontaneous circulation to uh, give more chance for the mother and more chance for the baby. Uh, what about ECMO? Recently, uh, the, the CPR uh, talked about the inclusion criteria of ECMO. D during CPR, we may need ECMO for witnessed cardiac arrest with immediate CPR. With re refractory CPR, currently defined as uh, CPR for more than 30 minutes. And even if the patient have received uh, thrombolysis, this is not a contraindication for insertion of ECMO cannula. And here is our uh, team who performed ECMO for a pregnant patient uh, in um, the French Castellani. At the end of, the, of uh, CPR, we should dispose uh, or clean all equipment used during CPR, clean any work service used for the equipment, especially the airway equipment, and um, put the contaminated um, um, aspiration in a disposable glove and uh, take it uh, for uh, sterilization. Then it's very important that when you remove the PPE, you, uh, remove it safely to avoid contamination, then perform ha hand hygiene. The last thing is post resuscitation debris. Uh, actually, um, um, we know that um, uh, if we you witnessed arrest of a mother, this is very uh, depressing um, experience for even for the team, not only for the uh, family. So you have to um, discuss what happened during resuscitation and take the feedback from your team and that's the best for their mental health and their uh, psychological feeling. 
uh, I don't know if we have just four minutes to see this uh, very important and very uh, demonstrative um, uh, video, which um, shows the maternal cardiac arrest uh, and what to do if we have to resuscitate a patient with COVID-19. You can play the video, Dr. Nesri, it's okay. Uh, okay. Okay, I... You can uh, go to uh, YouTube and um, um, you write uh, prompt course, P-R-O, uh, here is the prompt uh, course. It's a course of obstetric emergency uh, given by um, obstetricians and anesthesiologists. And uh, they have shared, actually the founder of the course have um, um, shared this um, 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 he talked about the course in um, Castle Raini during the uh, RCOG, the Royal College of Aesthetic and Gynecology meeting, uh, which was in Cairo. And uh, they came several times and uh, gave the um, course of um, obstetric emergency and how to manage. And that's why when we had to do online uh, course, uh, with the uh, Royal College, they invite me to give this uh, lecture about maternal uh, cardiac arrest. Maternal cardiac arrest, including during this pandemic, is thankfully rare. But when it does occur, the risks of COVID-19 requires additional consideration. Any patient in a healthcare setting may have COVID-19. UK and international station bodies deem chest compressions to be aerosol generated, so appropriate PPE is needed. Because PPE takes time to don, key team members should don full AGP PPE if caring for a woman at risk of deteriorating into cardiac arrest. The Resuscitation Council have produced a guide to help teams safely manage cardiac arrest during this pandemic. Firstly, recognizing cardiac arrest. If a woman collapses, check for signs of life. By placing a hand on the chest, or if trained to do so, check for a pulse. Can you increase the sound of the video, Dr. Nisreen, please? Sorry? The sound. Can you increase the volume of the sound? Um, I think it's uh, the maximum. Okay. Uh, if you need me to, um, uh, to talk and explain the video, can, no, it's okay. It, we can you? hear, but it's a, a, a bit, um, yani, you know, small volume, but it's okay. It's, uh, yani, we can hear. That's the same what I said. Put oxygen mask. The team came. And when they knew it is COVID-19, they have to do uh, full PPE. They gave the defibrillator for the first responder and she put the pads, closed the oxygen but did not remove the mask and gave three stack chops. The 
team takes the airway equipment and enters the room. Once they are in, they uh, release the uh, first responder. Um, hi, can, can you see the slides? Hello? Yes, yes, we can see. Okay. What about the baby? What's good for mother is good for baby. Here is uh, some uh, frequently asked questions for uh, healthcare providers. Uh, they are usually asked, is a chest compression a result generating procedure? Actually, it is the subject for International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation Review. They are reviewing the uh, studies uh, right now to uh, come with a conclusion. The Resuscitation Council of UK um, uh, is um, just for confirmed cases for COVID-19. Do we use the, uh, this algorithm for um, the confirmed cases of COVID-19? Actually, according to the Resuscitation Council of UK, the healthcare settings are treating all individuals as suspected COVID-19. What happens while awaiting the staff uh, to uh, put on PPE or uh, waiting for the defib to arrive? The time taking uh, to put on PPE and ensure staff safety is acceptable. It can be as low as one minute, but we should do it. To, uh, if you want to avoid delay in the hospital, a uh, patient at risk for cardiac arrest should be monitored and uh, all equipment for PPE should be available. Why there are uh, emphasis, uh, emphasis on DFEB and repeated shocks in the COVID-19 ALS algorithm? This is very important because patients with a shockable rhythm treated with early defibrillation have the best survival rates. And rhythm assessment and DFEB is not aerosol generating, so there is no risk of infection. Uh, that's why the resuscitation council recommend up to three shocks while awaiting the team uh, with uh, the correct PPE. But suppose that you are the rescuer and you already have your uh, full PPE against uh, a resurgenating procedure. In this case, only you can uh, go with the algorithm of um, um, arrest in normal patient. Do chest compression can be given between the shocks as usual. Uh, the ICU patient might require ventilation in prone position. What should we do, do if the patient has a cardiac arrest while she is in prone position? That's very difficult. 
the pregnant patient, COVID-19, in prone position, and arrested. <laughs> anyway, we can start chest compression by compressing the spine in between the scapulae. Uh, the normal compression rate, 100 to 120 per minute, depth of compression, 5 to 6 centimeters. And if uh, cardiac arrest rhythm is shockable, we can give shocks putting the pads in bi-axillary uh, uh, position. But if there is problem with the airway, we have to turn the patient rapidly to a uh, supine position. And if the initial attempt of resuscitation is unsuccessful, again, we have to turn the patient to supine position. And uh, the mechanical ventilation continue during chest compression, give 10 breaths per minute. Take home message. Please have a look at this um, um, figure. It's adopted from the uh, international guidelines, but I, I've made this um, 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 algorithm or this um, simple one. The uh, steps in uh, green means that these steps are safe to be done without full PPE. Recognize cardiac arrest by uh, unresponsiveness and the patient is not pre breathing and no carotid pulse. Activate cardiac arrest team and uh, state that it is COVID-19. If there is a shock of arrest, give um, uh, three shocks, up to three stacked shocks to achieve return of spontaneous circulation. Then the team arrives with PPE. All the steps will be uh, done, are highlighted in red. This means should be done with the PPE. CPR, restrict persons inside the, um, the room, uh, put oxygen mask, uh, perform chest compression and uh, manual left uterine displacement. Then um, regarding the airway, two persons uh, to perform uh, the um, uh, back valve mask, endotracheal tube or supraglottic device should be done by the most expert using video laryngoscopy. Then correct the four H's and four T's and prepare for post-mortem cesarean section. At the fourth minute, the obstetrician and neonatology team with full PPE should uh, perform the uh, cesarean section, get the baby out even if there is return of spontaneous circulation. At the end, dispose and clean equipment, remove PPE carefully and perform hand hygiene. And then the post-resuscitation uh, remember to do deep breathing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anistreen, for uh, this very informative lecture. And uh, we will give like uh, five minutes for any question to Dr. Anistreen. Um, the first question here, actually, everybody is uh, praising your lecture and say thank you much for this very informative um, productive lecture uh, is a very nice interesting question here from dr islam fuad during cpr with the shockable rhythm will we give three shocks once then one shock later or continue to give three shocks during cpr time with shockable rhythm yeah that's a good question uh, actually the stacked shocks even in the normal algorithm, when we perf perform three stacked shocks, we consider them as one shock. So if you give the three stacked shocks and uh, the patient is still in uh, the uh, shockable rhythm, you perform two minutes CPR and then give one shock and two minutes CPR and one shock and so on. So the three stacked shocks are given only once at the start. Uh, um, uh, I don't know, is it fortunately or does the long term outcome of room ventilation exist? I don't know, might be Dr. Khalid the answer this question. Oh, yes, Dr. Saad, uh, I ask, uh, I uh, answered the question in the question and answer, does I have it, however. You answered like. Uh, oh, yes. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, we can share uh, also what, um, what I have uh, written that um, uh, uh, as I told uh, all the audience uh, from the start of the lecture, we have a very limited evidence about the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, overall and the COVID-19 in the pregnant patients uh, specifically. 
And so uh, the 90 uh, uh, days morbidity and mortality after the uh, problem positioning is, um, uh, uh, or uh, data available uh, cannot be judged well because it's a very low uh, quality of evidence. And uh, we, we have- on, uh, Just case reports and case series. Yes. Yes, and so we have to stick to the uh, we have to stick to the to the best level of evidence we have. The Proceva trial uh, um, had proved that the brown positioning has a very good uh, uh, survival outcome uh, compared to the uh, conventional uh, uh, mechanical ventilation, and so we have to do the prone positioning. Especially, it has a minimal effect on the uh, pregnant uh, uh, mother, and so we have to try uh, the prone positioning before we move to um, another option like ECMO. Um, actually, uh, automated, automated defibrillator. This question is from Dr. Hilal Sadiqi. Uh, automated defibrillator cognizism, ED. Can we use uh, till uh, this yeah. till the team arrive? Yeah, actually, yes, um, and if, I've, um, I, I was through uh, the basic life support and uh, the guidelines for CPR for lay people. And there is recommendation that um, the lay people uh, who knows how to perform chest compression, they perform chest compression only CPR. And they can put mask on the, the patient's uh, mouth. And when they have the uh, AED, it's recommended to put the pads and then the, the AED will analyze the rhythm and uh, give the shocks. So for lay persons, it, you can use the AED. Um, uh, I, I don't know, is it fortunately or no, is it one question here? Uh, can we do a stepwise beep strategy for pregnant? Oh, yes, uh, I think Dr. this Samuel question uh, is for me. Uh, okay, uh, yes, we have to, we can do the uh, stepwise beep uh, uh, strategy for uh, the pregnant. Uh, as I say, also, um, the uh, difference between the protective lung strategy in the general population and uh, the pregnant population uh, is, uh, the, the, there is no difference, actually. Uh, uh, we have to do the protective lung strategy as the uh, 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 we do in the general population. Uh, would you be kind to open your video, Dr. Kelly and Dr. Marianne, if possible? Um, uh, actually, I have any questions, Dr. Rohasmat. I don't have uh, any more questions here. Um, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Everybody is raising this okay. scientific, uh, excellent scientific webinar. Uh, yeah. You can go ahead, Bro Hasmat. No? Yeah, uh, I would like to thank all my colleagues for preparing uh, for this uh, webinar, uh, especially in the times of uh, having only online uh, Zoom. So I would like to ask uh, Professor and uh, Sociologist Dr. Rasreen and uh, uh, lecture and uh, physiologist Dr. Khalid Sarhan and Dr. Marianne Magdi for all these efforts. Uh, also, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Dr. Magid Salah. And of course, um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Saad Mahdi, uh, who helped us a lot and uh, um, uh, interact with us uh, with the Mega uh, Online uh, Association. Um, I hope, uh, as Dr. Ayman Dessoui said, that this is uh, only the beginning and we would like to meet again and uh, transmit um, our uh, humble knowledge to our colleagues. So thank you, uh, uh, thank you very much, all attendees, and uh, thank you, very thank special you. thanks to you, Dr. Sam. Thank, thank you thank very you. much. Uh, I'm so proud to be part of this um, interactive um, system between uh, we can deliver and we can listen to the speakers the top speaker all over the world without moving an inch so you can deliver your lecture from home you can listen to your lecture from home we are bridging all the bridges with science and the top speaker from everywhere and um, from 
uh, Ireland. I would like to convey my thanks to all top stars from Cairo University Anesthesia Department of Obstetric Unit, Prof. Asmat Hijazi, Prof. Uh, uh, Nisreen Rifai, Dr. Khalid Sarhan, Dr. Marianne Magdi, and the, before uh, Dr. Ayman Dusuki, the uh, new uh, head of the department, and the Professor uh, Khalid uh, Magid uh, Salah for this uh, wish. I would like to transfer only one message to Dr. Magid Salah. Uh, there is a lot of call for pediatric uh, webinar. Uh, I hope he will listen to us and will encourage our colleagues in pediatric anesthesia. And to yeah, the, uh, the, the, the most um, uh, uh, webinars or uh, scientific days that uh, at, are attended from a um, uh, lot of anesthetists, the majority of them is obstetric and uh, pediatric. That's so right. I suppose maybe next month we'll we'll have the pediatric uh, scientific day. Usually uh, we start the obstetrician and then the uh, pediatric day. Uh, so I, 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 um, I arranging for this. Yeah, in, in your behalf, Prof. I would like to thank all other our colleagues who are attending this two hour and a half a very wealthy, a very nice uh, scientific uh, evening. Uh, 210 uh, attendees in the webinar, a lot of likes, a lot of uh, issues on the Facebook interaction. I would like to uh, tell you that uh, the all lectures are going to be professionally edited and going to be uploaded to your YouTube Mega or Mega Medical Association. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, and all yours now, uh, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saad, again, and thank you all my colleagues, and hope we will meet soon, inshallah, in inshallah. other scientific online activities. Thank, you. thank you. So thank you. It was very interesting. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank Good you. Time. Thank, thank you. you.